Right on time. We're going to talk a little bit today about being right on time. You know, church, when we trust and we rely on God, things in our life happen right on time. I want you to look at your neighbor with a big, cheesy, early riser smile under that mask that you're wearing. And I want you to remind that neighbor, my God's never late. He's punctual. Hallelujah. Let's open our Bible to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Habaul? Habakkuk. Prophet Habakkuk. After Nahum, did I make that worse for you? Before Zephaniah, one of those small books, Habakkuk. Are we there? Right on time. Habakkuk chapter 2. We serve an on-time God. Never late, never early. Right on time. Lay your hand on chapter 2 of Habakkuk. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you this morning, Lord, that your word will fall into good fertile ground. Cultivate the ground of our hearts this morning and open our minds and our hearts to receive your word, oh God. Let us be doers of your word and not just hearers of your word, oh God, so that we can experience your power and be a fruit for your honor and for your glory. In every early riser, say amen. 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 Habakkuk 2. Two. Right on time. Then the Lord answered me and said, are we there? Write the vision and engrave it plainly on clay tablets so that the one who reads it will run. For the vision is yet for the appointed future time. It hurries toward the goal of fulfillment. It will not fail. Say, it will not fail. It will not fail. Even though it may delay, wait patiently for it. Because it will certainly come. It will not delay. It may delay in your eyes. But in God's eyes, it's right on time. The Lord speaks to prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk speaks to God and is talking to God. And then God responds to Habakkuk. And he says, write down the vision. Write it down. Jot it down. Write down the vision that I'm about to give you. Now, I'm here to ask all of us here, including myself, what has been the vision that God has given you? What is the vision, what is the dream that God has given you? What is it that God has deposited in you? What are you believing God for? What are you believing for? God for because your vision is not the same as the person at your right or your left vision or the one before you or behind you. Your vision is your vision. My vision is my vision. Amen. So God tells the prophet, he says, write down the vision. Write it down. Jot it down, people of God. And pray over it so that the adversary will have no choice but to run from it. Because if you believe it enough to write it down, and if you believe it enough to pray over it, then you're believing it enough so that the enemy and the adversary can lose his power over that vision 
that you're praying for. Amen. Write it down, jot it down, for there is an appointed time. There is a set time. There is a designated time. There is a scheduled time set in order by God in which that vision shall come. Say it shall come. Look at three people and say it shall come, shall come, shall come. Look at three more people and say it will come. It will come. It will come. It must come to pass. Jot it down. Write it down so that you can read it every day, so that you can remind yourself every day what I have deposited in you and pray over that thing. Because in due season, come on, in due season, you will reap if you do not give up on that vision. If you do not stop praying on that vision. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you that there is no devil in hell that can stop the vision of God from coming to pass in your life if you don't let him. If you don't let him. Now, if you let him, that's a whole different league of, of preaching right there. But if you know who you are, and you know whose you are, and you know what God has deposited in you, then you're going to jot that thing down. You're going to pray over that thing. And you're going to keep on praying until you see that thing materialize in your life. The word of God says, it shall not fail. It shall not fail. What does it say? It shall not fail. It will certainly come to pass. It will not delay. You see that? For the vision is yet for an appointed time. It hurries towards the goal of fulfillment. It will not fail. Jeremiah 29 11 says, God has a plan for you. A plan, a vision for you. One of good, to do you good and not to do you evil. To give you hope in a future. The plan of God for you is good. The vision that God has for you is bigger than what you have for yourself. Hallelujah. God has a plan. Look at your neighbor and say, God has a plan for me. And it's coming right on time. Come on, it's coming right on time. It may not be my time, but it's coming right on time. It's going to arrive right on time. It's going to come right on time. Come on. So you got to position yourself. You got to hold up your head. You got to stand like you're ready for it. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got to keep your heart clean. You got to keep your head up. You got to keep on trusting God. While you're waiting on God, trusting God, you got to ignore the naysayers. You got to ignore the haters. As I heard somebody once say, well, you know, we that are believers, we talk too much about haters, and I'm going to keep on talking about them because they're all around you. They're all around you. The more you grow in God, the bigger the number of your haters also grow. Don't you think for a minute that you're going to get so anointed that you have no one that don't like you. If you read the life of the prophets and even the life of Jesus himself, you see that they had a whole leap of them all around them, watching them. You got to position yourself. If you know that you know that you know that God has deposited a vision in you. My question to all of us here today is, what is that vision? What is that dream? And don't limit your God. Don't think that that can't be from God because it's too big. If it's big, then it is from God. If it's something that's out of your own capacity to do, then it is from God. If it's something that pushes you out of your comfort zone, then it is from God. Because what God has for you is great. What God has for you is good. God has plans that is good for your life. But you got to position yourself. How do I position myself when I'm on my knees? When I'm on my knees, I am positioning myself to receive that vision. Hallelujah. You got to keep on doing good. You got to
to keep on doing good. Even if no one else around you is doing good, you got to keep on doing good. Because your prize, your reward doesn't come from those who are around you. It comes from God that is above you. It comes from God that lives in you. Hallelujah. You've got to position yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, he's right on time. He's right on time. Let's go to the book of Esther this morning. Our God is an on-time God. And I'm here to remind some of us who think that he's taking his time, who thinks that he's late, who's been praying and you have not yet seen what you've been praying for. Position yourself and keep trusting God because he will never fail. Esther chapter 5, verse 9. Haman went away that day joyful and in good spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate refusing to stand up or show fear before him, he was filled with rage toward Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman controlled himself and went home. There he sent for his friends and his wife Zeresh. Then Haman recounted to them the glory of his riches, the large number of his sons, in every instance in which the king had magnified him and how he had promoted him over the officials and servants of the king. Haman also said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me Come to the king, come with the king to the banquet that she had prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Now I just want to say here before we go any further that the God that we serve, he has a way of setting up our enemies in such a way that they are completely oblivious to what's really going on. Can I repeat that? We serve a God who knows how to set up our enemies in such a way that they are completely oblivious to what is going on. Haman was an enemy of the Jews. The word of God tells us that Haman hated the Jews with a strange passion. And with the talk that he had, the smooth talk that Haman had, and being close in the king's court to the king, he found a way around tricking the king into signing an edict to do away with the Jewish people, to annihilate the Jewish people. Though the king did not know what he was signing or didn't know what Haman, who Haman was referring to, he gave Haman the power, he gave him the signet ring and gave him the power to write it into law. And we know that back in those days, the Persian law, once it went into law, there was no revoking the law. So Haman, hating the people of God, so much and wanting to see the people of God gone from the face of the earth, came up with an idea of setting a date to annihilate every Jew that lived in the province of Susa and beyond. In every province that King Xerxes was in control of. So the date was set. And the word of God says that when the Jews heard of the edict because it was blatantly plastered in their neighborhoods, that they got together, Mordecai with them, and they began to fast and pray. They went to Queen Esther. They found a way to get to Queen Esther and tell Queen Esther what was going on. And she asked them to fast and pray for three days. And while they fasted and prayed, they were trusting God. They had positioned themselves because they knew there's no way that God took us out or allowed us to come out of our country to come here 
so that we can all be annihilated in a foreign land. All of us here, no matter what generation we are, we come from foreign land. Every American comes from somewhere. Hmm? And we all came here for what? A better life, prosperity, being able to help our family, to give our family what we didn't have back home. That's the story of every American, no matter where you come from. Yes? And so it was also with the Jewish people because everywhere they went, God blessed them. Foreign land, home, God was with them when they turned to God. But the edict had went into law and there was no way they could change it. It was law and that was the day that they were going to find annihilation. So when they prayed and they fasted, this one here thought himself very highly. He became filled with pride. After all, I'm Haman now. I'm the king's right man. I give the king orders in a way that he thinks it's advice. You got to be careful who you hear and who you listen to and who's in your circle. You remember what I tell you all the time, your circle got to be tight. It's got to be small. Are you with me? So this day, Queen Esther had called for a banquet. And she invited Haman to the banquet because she needed to let Xerxes know who was his right-hand man. But that day at that banquet, she did not, for whatever reason it was, she did not have a chance to tell the king what she really wanted to tell the king about Haman. Hmm? So this day he went home, he left the banquet all jolly and happy and joyful, thinking that he had it all together. After all, besides the king, I was the only one invited. Nobody else, no other official was invited. Queen Esther favors me. She sure did. She sure did. But her favor was slightly different from what you think it is. Listen, you got to do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. You got to learn, early riser, to smile and wave. Come on. Look at your neighbor and say, learn to smile and wave. You got to learn how to smile and wave at people, especially those who don't like you. You got to learn how to smile and wave at those who don't like you. You got to learn how to treat those who treat you bad good. Not because you're a fool, but because you know what they're up to. And you're bigger than them. Are you with me so far? You got to learn how to smile and wave. You got to learn how to nod nicely. You know? When you know what they said yesterday about you. And now they're in front of you. And you can't say what you really want to say. But you told Peter to sit down and be quiet. And you just nod. Mm -hmm. Good morning. How are you? Yes. I'm blessed. And you? Oh, praise God. Huh? Come on now. You got to learn how to do something nice to those who don't do nothing nice for you. If you know where they live, send them flowers, send them a fruit basket. It's coals on their head. You see, Esther was smart. She could have just blurted out to the king as soon as she found out, this is what Haman did, this, 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 this. But she knew that there's a time for everything under the sun. And before he goes down, I'm going to treat him right. Because when he goes down, it's not because I'm bringing him down. He brought himself down. Hmm? You got to remember that those who rise up against you for no cause is rising up against the God in you. And if you know that they're rising up against the God in you, then you can step back 
and you can behave nicely. You can be nice to those who are not nice to you. It, it's, it's actually possible. Because the Spirit of God lives in you, the Spirit of God will lead you to do that. Because our justice comes from God. So he left the banquet and he was so happy and he was so jolly. And when he got home, when he, when he left, he saw Mordecai. <laughs> he saw his enemy there. And when Mordecai saw him, Mordecai stood. And didn't pay him any homage as everybody else did. Because Mordecai knew what he was up to. And Mordecai knew the God that he served. Mordecai understood that I will not bow to anyone but my God. So when the Bible says when Haman saw Mordecai, raged, filled him up. But he didn't want to make a scene right there and then, so he left and he went home. And when he got home, he began to just talk about all that he had and the number of sons that he had and all the riches that he has. You got to be careful with people that talk like that, you know. People that lack humility is not somebody for you to hang with. You got to see who you hang with. Because if you hang out long enough with them, they can rub off on you. So the word of God says that he was in his house and he was talking about his riches and talking about this and talking about that. And he said, even Queen Esther didn't invite nobody but me to the banquet. Now I'm special. You sure are, man. And the word of God says, verse 13, Yet all of this, and he continued to say, yet all of this does not satisfy me as long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him, have gallows 50 cubits high made. And in the morning asked the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. And then go joyfully to the banquet with the king. And the advice pleased Haman. So he had the gallows made. Take heed the advice that you listen to. You got to be very careful, early riser. No matter how godly a person may seem, or how well they speak in tongues, or how much of the scripture they can quote, or how much they pray, or how much they come to church, the Bible says you got to test the spirits. Not all spirits that say they are of God are of God. You got to test the spirits. You got to be careful with who, I mean, in this case, I, who cares what they told Haman because he was already destined. But in your case, you got to be careful who you listen to. Because sometimes the ones that are the closest to you may slip sometimes and say something they should not have said. And if you're not spiritually discerned, if you're not in the spirit, you're going to take that and think that it's okay to do what they said without once asking God for direction. And you could do the wrong thing. So he got together and his family said, well, listen, I don't know why you're making a fuss about all this. You're the second man in power in the kingdom. Have the gallows built. Tomorrow morning, go to the king before the banquet and go... And just let them know, listen, there's this guy named Mordecai. We got to get rid of him. And because you're the second man in the kingdom, the king's going to go and just give you what you want. Hmm? So the thought pleased Haman, and he had the gallows built. You know, it was amazing. If we were to know how many people have traps set for you, if God were to right now open our understanding so that we can see how many people are really for you and how many are not for you, that'll change our prayer life. That'll change our prayer life. Right away, Haman went and he built those gallows. Chapter 6, verse 1. On that night... On that night, look at Geneva said that very night, the same night, the very same night, the king could not sleep. So he ordered that the book of the records and memorable deeds, 
the chronicles be brought. And they were read before the king. And it was found written there how Mordecai had reported that Bigtha and Teresh, two of the king's Enochs, who, had, who were doorkeepers, had planned to attack King Xerxes. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been given to Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. Church, let me just tell you something. Don't try to exalt yourself when you think that you ought to be exalted. Wait on God for everything. If you did a good deed and you didn't get a thank you or a recognition, don't worry. And don't try to make your deed known to others so that you can be recognized by others. Let it be so. And let God, like they say, take the wheel. Amen? Because he's an on-time God. You see, when it happened back in the days, when Mordecai overheard the two Enoch's planning to kill the king, he went straight ahead and he reported the two Enoch's. And they were found guilty and they were killed. But no honor was given to Mordecai for that. And you know that usually when something like that happens, you're honored. You're given a, a title or you're given a certain position. But Mordecai didn't receive any of that. And that did not change Mordecai's nature. Mordecai still continued to serve the king at the king's door. Still continued to be faithful at the gate. Still continued to do what he was called to do, even though he didn't receive the recognition that he thought he should have received. But our God is an on-time God. Our God is an on-time God. There was a reason why he did not receive that recognition. Maybe some of you are working so hard in your workplace and you feel like you don't receive recognition for your hard work. You don't receive a thank you for your hard work. Lord have mercy, you haven't even received a raise in how long for the work that you do. But God is an on-time God. God sees your work. God sees your heart. God sees your sacrifice and he's faithful. He will come at the right time. Hallelujah. So the word of God says that very same night, look at the timing of God. That very same night that Haman had those gallows built, God tormented the king in his bed. God said, all right, you're building it there. Let me get you here. The king could not sleep. He tossed and he turned and he tossed and he turned. And God did not allow the king to rest until he called in one of his men to bring in the chronicles to be read. And out of all the chronicles that King Xerxes had, what chronicle came up? Mordecai's. Come on now. Mordecai's chronicle. The story in the history of what Mordecai did. And the king is sitting in his bed and he's listening to what Mordecai did. And then all of a sudden it comes to him. What did we do for Mordecai for this? Did we ever honor Mordecai for this? What was Mordecai's reward for saving my life? And the scribe answered the king. He said, nothing was done for Mordecai. And the king thought to himself, nothing was done for Mordecai. <laughs> Our God is an on-time God. He will shift things on your behalf. He will work things out in your direction. He will move what he needs to move, replace what he needs to replace, do what he needs to do in order to see that you are where you ought to be. Are you with me? Hallelujah. So the word of God says, he could not sleep at all. So he sent... For the scribe, the scribe read it. What honor and distinction has been given to Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. So the king said, 
who is in the courts? Now Haman, come on now, had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to ask the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows which he had prepared for him. And I'm telling you, they are vicious. Your enemies are vicious, but your God is bigger. Your enemies are evil, but your God is good. Your enemies plan, but your God makes a way out. He wasted no time. Early at the crack of dawn, there was more. There was Haman at the court of the king. I got to get this thing over with before I go to the banquet. I can't go to the banquet knowing that, 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 that Mordecai is still sitting at that gate. How wicked can you be to have an innocent man executed and then wash your hands and go eat? Not so. You could have hung anybody else, but not Mordecai. Because Mordecai got a relationship with God. Mordecai knows God. Woe unto them that rise up against the anointed of the Lord. This is why I tell you over and over and over again, your business is not trying to figure out what people are saying about you. Your business is not trying to figure out what they're doing against you. Your business is to live your life, serve God, be happy, smile, wave, have a good attitude, and let, listen, just let it fall wherever it may fall. Because the more you focus on them, the stronger they become. But the more you focus on God, the stronger you become. Are you with me, church? So the word of God says that Haman came, all dressed up, ready, gallows built. And as soon as he finished reading the chronicles of the king, the king said, well, who's in the court? I got to send somebody out. Who's in the court? And here comes Haman. <laughs> here comes Haman. I'm telling you, church, I, I, I am a testimony of this. God will use the very ones who plotted against you to, listen, to raise you up to a level that when you look down at them, you see that God even used them to get you where you are today. So there was Haman in the court. The king's servant said to him, look, Haman is standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. I want you to look at your neighbor with a big smile. And I want you to let them know that God will escort your enemy to the right court. Come on. God will escort them to the right court. Wherever they may be, God will escort them to the right court. As long as you trust God, I'm telling you, church, there's nothing better than to live trusting God. With your full trust in God. Loving God, living right, right attitude, right mindset, clean heart. Because when you live like that, God got you. When you live like that, even when hell is breaking loose around you, God will sustain you. When everything's going wrong around you, God will make you right. God will keep you standing. God will, God will be the very solid ground beneath your feet when everything else is shaking and breaking. So here comes Haman. And the king said, well, let him in. I don't know what he's doing here so early, but let him in. My God. So Haman came in. And the king said to him, and this is, and I love this because the king didn't even give Haman time to talk. He came into the presence of the king. The king started talking to Haman. You got to be two steps ahead of him. And the king said to him, listen, Haman, what is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? Now Haman, thinking to himself, who would the king desire to honor more than me? Mm -mm. So Haman said to the king, well, king, for the man whom the king desires to honor 
Let a royal robe be brought, which the king has worn, in the horse on which the king has ridden, and in all whose head the royal crown has been placed. And let the robe and the horse be handed over to the one of the king's most noble. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> this made me laugh yesterday. I was laughing for I don't know how many minutes. But let the robe and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. And let him dress the man whom the king de delights to honor in the royal robe. And lead him on horseback throughout the open square of the city. And proclaim with a loud voice before him, this is what shall be done for the man whom the king desires to honor. <laughs> Church, I'm telling you, your enemies will obliviously, yet strategically, set you up for a blessing. I'm telling you, when he came before the king, the king didn't even give him time to say good morning. The king said, listen, Haman, what should be done for a man that the king desires to honor? What should I do since you're my right-hand man and I listen to your advice? What should I do for a man that I desire to honor? And Haman thought to himself, well, hey. <laughs> Who is he going to honor but me? Is me. So this is what you should do, king. Let a royal robe be brought out. One that you wore. Not just any royal robe, but one that you wore in front of your people. Put it on the man. Put the man on your royal horse. The one that you ride. And let that man just be walked around with the horse around the city walked by a very important noble of yours. And let that noble proclaim out loud, this is what will happen to the man whom the king desires to honor. Because within himself, Haman thought, it's me. It's got to be me. After all, last night I was the only one invited to the queen's banquet. I'm going again tonight. He completely forgot what he even went to go talk to the king about. My God. The word of God says, listen, what the enemy planned for evil, God will turn it around for your good. How many in here and watching you can testify of times that your back was against the wall and you didn't know how you were coming out of it? And that very thing that you thought was going to take you out was the very thing that God used to elevate you to a different level. Today you're stronger because of that thing. Today you're wiser because of that thing. Today you're closer to God because of that thing. Had it not been for that thing, I would not be where I am today. So the word of God says, Mordecai, he was minding his business. He was there as usual at the king's gate. And this talk was going on in the court. All things work out for the good of those who love God. Then the king sent to Haman. And let's close with this quickly. Take the royal robe and the horse as you have said. And do this for Mordecai the Jew, who is sitting in the king's gate. Leave out nothing of all that you have said. Look at your neighbor said, nothing will be left out. My blessing is coming right on time. My blessing is coming right on time. The king heard what Haman said. And he said, all right, quick, 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 quick. Everything you said right now, that Jew Mordecai that's at my gate, go ahead and do that for him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Hey, 
Naaman when he heard what the king said? The who? <laughs> you mean you want that, that, the Jew that's at the door? Can you say his name again? Mordecai. And leave nothing out. You were so detailed, Haman. You were so detailed. The robe that I wore, the horse that I wore, the seal of royalty on the horse's head, all of that, you were so detailed. I love the detail. Now take all that detail and do with Mordecai what you just said should be done for the one that the king desires to honor. I'm telling you, church, we serve the king of kings. And his scepter, when his scepter is reached out towards us, there's no enemy in the court that can stop the king's favor from reaching our lives. He went and he had to do what the king instructed. Actually, what he instructed. He instructed himself how to do it. So he went throughout the city. And this is what will happen. I can just imagine the tone in which Haman used. And I can imagine Mordecai on the horse. Say it a little louder, please. <laughs> the word of God says, and you can read it later, that when he finished that, he went home and he was so angry. He felt so disrespected. He felt disgraced. And when he was home feeling like that, ready to just, I don't know what, the doorbell rang, if they had doorbells at that time. And it was a servant from the palace saying, hey, come on, the banquet. Queen Esther's waiting. Oh, well, at least I'm still in favor with the king. So you think. And if you continue reading, you see that he went to the banquet. The second banquet that she did, she spoke to the king about it. As soon as she told the king, the king's fury rose against Haman. And Haman knew exactly what was going to happen to him. And the very same gallows that Haman built for Mordecai, the king ordered that he be hung on it. I'm here to tell you something, church. Time only goes forward. It makes no sense for us to be wallowing in in. in stuck on yesterday or last week or last month or last year time only goes forward so i'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter what happened back then you got to focus on your life going forward and you got to keep your heart clean you got to keep your eyes fixed on god and stop worrying about what people are saying and doing against you because the more time you focus on that, it's less time that you have to fulfill your mission, to fulfill your purpose. If the enemy can frustrate you and cause you to lose time, then he's got you where he wants you. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Time only goes forward. Whatever they're plotting, it'll fall on their own heads. I'm telling you right now. Whatever they're saying is going to be proven wrong. I'm telling you right now. So you cannot waste your time concerning yourself with what they're doing and saying when you can be using that time fulfilling your purpose. Mordecai understood that if God can't deliver us, then nobody can. So he entered into that fast with the queen and he said, listen, God, it's in your hands now. I'm going to keep on going to work. I'm going to keep on doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I got to be at the gate at a certain time. I'm going to keep on doing that while I'm believing you for your deliverance. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you're going to do it. Because you're an on-time God. And you do not fail. Hallelujah. He's an on-time God. And he does not fail. I don't know what battle you're facing, early rising. But whatever it is that you're facing, whether it's financial 
Whether it's a family problem, whether it's a physical ailment, whether it's a sentimental issue, I'm here to tell you that if you trust God, if you stand on the word of God, if you believe that God is who he says he is and that he's always on time, you're going to continue waiting on God. You're going to continue trusting God. People can rise up against you. Hell can break loose around you. Edicts can come against you. You can find yourself in courts. But I'm here to tell you that the God that you serve, he will make a way where there seems to be no way. He's an on-time God. He may not come on your time, but he'll come right on time. He'll come right on time. And when he comes, I pray that he finds you in faith. When he comes, I pray that he finds you still trusting God. Because if you're still trusting God, if you're still praying, if you're still believing, if you're still jotting down the vision and praying over the vision, then you're going to see that vision happen no matter how much hell can break loose in your life. Because what's going on around you doesn't define who you are. It doesn't define who you are. Mordecai had everything to give up. Mordecai had everything to say, you know what, God, where are you? We served you faithfully all these years and now an edict is coming against us. And not just any edict, but they want us dead, gone. But he trusted God. And even when his enemies, every time he looked at his enemies, he saw his enemies being so-called blessed, going ahead. And how many times has that happened to us? We're praying, we're trusting God, we're believing, we're fasting. And it seems like the unbelievers are getting ahead while we're behind. And it's like, what in the world's going on? I don't understand it. She goes and she, she, she's an unbeliever. She cursing at work. She's she waking up work and she's getting the raise and she's getting this and she's getting that. And here I am. But I'm here to tell you, trust God. Keep waiting on God. Stand on God. Jot down the vision. Keep on praying. Keep on believing. Keep on trusting. Because in due season... You will reap if you don't give up. Stand to your feet this morning. You will reap if you do not give up. You will reap if you do not give up. Our God is an on-time God. Time was running out for the Jews. Every time they looked at their watches, they thought, my God, it's getting closer and closer to that day. But the whole time, God already had it set. God orders your steps. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. When you trust God, he will never disappoint. The world is constantly tugging at you, constantly pulling at you. It wants your attention here, it wants your attention there, it wants your attention there. No, you got to focus on God. You got to focus on God. What do you want God to do for you? What's the vision? You have to have a vision. Without a vision, you perish. What is your vision? You can't wake up every day and just live day by day. You have to have a vision. You have to have a plan. You have to have a dream. You have to be praying for something. Oh, it is what it is. It is, it is what it is. But you, what, what are you doing about it? I'm here to tell you what the Lord told Prophet Habakkuk. Write it down. If you have not yet written your vision in a journal and have a journal as a prayer journal, you're going to go out today before the snow falls. And you're going to go buy a journal at the Dollar Tree, at Staples, at Target, Walmart, wherever. And you're going to keep that journal with you. And you're going to jot down your vision. You're going to jot down your dream. You're going to jot down your prayer request. And you're going to pray over that vision. You're going to present that vision to God. 
And you're going to say, God, I know that many enemies may rise up against this vision. But God, this is my vision. This is what I'm believing you to do in my life. This is what I'm believing you to do in my life. There's got to be a purpose for my life. I can't just wake up every day and go about my day and go to bed at night and nothing happens. There's got to be a reason. There's got to be a purpose. And I want that purpose fulfilled in my life. I want to live my purpose. I want to walk in my purpose. I want to walk in the power of God. I don't come to church to play church. I don't got time for that. Time only goes forward. I've wasted enough of my time. I've wasted enough months and weeks and years of my time. I'm not going back that way. 2020, I got a lot to recover. And one by one, I'm going to recover it all. I'm going to recover it all one by one. But Lord, this is my vision. This is the vision right here. And as you pray on that vision, God will drop even more things in you. And as God drops things in you, jot it down. Jot the date and the time and the hour and what it was that God dropped in you. And when you open up your, your, your prayer journal, you're going to see dates and times that God spoke to you. And after a while, you're going to go back and you can connect those dots. And you can see this day here, God dropped this into my spirit. I prayed for it. I fast for it. And here it is. This connects to this one here. And then when you step back, you begin to see how everything begins to connect. But you have to have a vision. Hallelujah. Can I pray for you this morning? Can I pray for you this morning? Bow your head there. Lay your hand over your heart. Hallelujah. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like eagles' wings. Lord, this is something that is many times easier said than done. Easier saying than done, oh God. Especially when there is so much going on around us, oh God. Sometimes we want to force your hand in certain situations. Sometimes we even doubt whether you're giving it your attention. But Lord, we need to keep on trusting you, Lord. Keep on Keeping on, oh God. My God, like Mordecai, Father, it wasn't easy. He had a huge situation before him. A problem beyond his ability to solve. But he trusted in you, oh God. He, along with all the other Jews, fasted and they prayed. When there's nothing else that we can do, we can pray. When there's nothing else that we can do, we can fast and position ourselves to receive your answer, oh God. Even though situations may be bigger than us many times, Lord, they're not bigger than you. So Father, I ask you this morning, Lord, that whatever it is that is the situation, in the life of this early riser, whatever problem that this man or this woman is facing, whatever financial difficulty that they're going through, whatever health problem that they're in, oh God, whatever family problem that they may be facing right now, do it, God. Do what we can't do, oh God. Reach where we can't reach, oh God. Speak where our voice doesn't go, oh God. Touch where we cannot touch. Transform the situation, oh God. But Lord, I pray that you will keep our heart fixed on you. Our trust immovable, oh God. Our faith and our hope unshakable, oh God. 
Lord, this world is going crazy. Everything that is good is considered evil. And everything that's evil is considered good. Everything is backwards in the world that we're in right now. And the world is tugging at us at every hour of the day. Through family members, through social media, through the news, through work. But Lord, I pray for your people, oh God. I pray that you keep your people grounded on you, oh God. I pray that you keep your people's faith steadfast on you, oh God. I pray, oh God, that you will help this man and this woman, oh God, overcome the situation that they may be in right now. Whatever season of their life that this person is in, oh God, you are the God of all seasons. You are the God that is above every situation. You are a God that is above every problem, oh God. Oh God, reach down your hand in the direction of your people, oh God, and strengthen your people, uplift your people, help your people, oh God. Help your people, oh God. Help your people, oh God. Lift your people up. Strengthen your people, oh God. Fix their feet on solid ground. Oh God, we ask you this morning to do what we can't do. Go where we can't go. Transform the situation. Heal, deliver, restore. Bring peace and joy, my God. Even in the midst of the storms, oh God. Help us to trust you. Help us to hold our faith on your word. Help us, oh God, even if we're slipping, oh God, help us to keep your word in the center of our life, oh God. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, oh God. Oh God, help us to position ourselves for the vision that you've given us, for the dream that you've given us, oh God, for the purpose that you filled us with, oh God. Because the enemy is all around us, constantly around us, like a roaring lion, like your word says, seeking someone that he can devour. But that's not our portion, oh God. It's not our portion, oh God. I ask you, Lord, cover every early riser. Cover their families. Cover their loved ones with the precious blood of Jesus. And deliver every early riser, my God, from the snare of the enemy. Deliver every early riser, my God, from the trap of the enemy, oh God. Oh God, keep your people's faith fixed on you, oh God. Keep your people's hearts fixed on you, oh God. Lift them up. Lift their head up. Position your people for victory, oh God. We have been called for such a time as this. There is an anointing upon your life, early riser. There is a power that has been drawn from God upon your life. There is a purpose on your life. You're here for a reason. And the reason is to glorify the name of God. It's to be the hands of God, the feet of God, the eyes of God, the mouth of God. Oh, hallelujah. So here we are, Lord. And we position ourselves, oh God. As we trust in you, oh God. To do what we cannot do. Bind every demonic spirit. Every demonic force. Bind, oh God. Every distracting spirit. Every wicked spirit. Every foul spirit. Every evil spirit. Every negative spirit. Every negative word. Every negative thought. Every downgrading thought. Every fearful thought. Every doubtful thought. We cast it down. We break its chains. We break its ropes in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Here we ask you this morning, Lord. As you did it for Mordecai. As you did it for your people back then. Do it for your people today, oh God. 
Because even some of us here today, consciously or unconsciously, there's been an edict placed on our life by hell. But we're here to stand against that edict and to let that edict know that the God that we serve is well able to deliver us. The God that we serve is well able to keep us. The God that we serve is well able to break every eating, to destroy all the work of the enemy, to confound and confuse all the plans of the enemy against the life of God's people. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke your work. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. We frustrate the plans of the enemy. We frustrate the plans of hell against this early rise, against this family, against their children, against their marriage, against their work, against their business, against their plans, against their dreams, against their vision, against their purpose. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we cast it down, we cast it down, we cast it down, we cast it down this morning, we cast down all the plans and plots of the enemy, all the plans and all the plots of the enemy, we cast it down, we break it and frustrate it in the name of Jesus, and we trust you Lord. We position ourselves right where you want us, oh God. And we will continue to speak life. We will continue to speak joy. We will continue to speak peace. We will continue to speak prosperity. We will continue to speak wholeness. We will continue to speak happiness in our homes. We will continue to speak greatness upon our children's lives. We will continue to speak unity in our homes, in our marriages, in the name of Jesus. We will continue to speak prosperity into our financial life. Abundance, greatness, open doors in the name of Jesus. We stand against every edict of the enemy this morning known and unknown we cast them down this morning for greater is he that is in you early riser than he that is coming against you and like Haman many of those who have risen up against you you shall see their downfall with your eyes you shall see it but it shall not come near your dwelling place. For you have put your trust in the Lord. You serve him faithfully. You love him with all your heart. And he's got you. He protects you. He directs you. He guides you. He leads you. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Say no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper say it again no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper for greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world hallelujah 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 lord we place all that we are and all that we hope to be, all that we have, Lord, in your hands. And thank you, Lord, for your protection. Thank you, Lord, for your covering. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Our early riser, you're covered. You are protected. You are shielded by the mighty hand of God and no weapon that is formed against you formed against your family formed against your dreams formed against your vision formed against your purpose will ever prosper for God himself frustrates the plans of the enemy oh hallelujah 
We bless your name, oh God. We glorify your name, oh God. And we thank you, oh God, for doing what we cannot do. We trust you, Lord. Say, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. Hallelujah. Do what we cannot do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. And amen. Hallelujah.